This presentation will provide an overview of the current Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, or AHCPR, recommendations for the care of patients with heart failure secondary to left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Emphasis will be given to patient counseling and education, as well as to the initial pharmacological management of patients with this most common form of heart failure. These clinical practice guidelines, and here is the um, one for healthcare practitioners, heart failure evaluation and care of patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, as well as the companion booklets, um, this one is a quick reference guide, as well as a patient and family guide, living with heart disease, is it heart failure? These guidelines were published or developed, I should say, by a multidisciplinary panel consisting of a variety of healthcare professionals as well as healthcare consumer representatives. So many of us as healthcare practitioners, especially nurses when we are called to educate and counsel our patients, need to really revisit, relook at what we're telling our patients. And hopefully this presentation will help to clarify some of those issues for you. The first thing I'd like to do is take a look at what we mean by heart failure. Heart failure is defined as a clinical syndrome or condition characterized by signs and symptoms of intravascular and interstitial volume overload, for example, pulmonary rails, shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, as well as signs and symptoms of inadequate tissue perfusion. For example, poor exercise tolerance or easy fatigability. Heart failure results when the heart's cardiac output is not adequate enough to meet the body's needs. Now in reference to terminology, and I should state here that when I use the term panel, I'm referring to the multidisciplinary panel which developed the guidelines that we're going to be discussing here today on heart failure. Now in reference to terminology, the term in the past, CHF, or congestive heart failure, has been used to describe the syndrome that we've just talked about. The panel recommends that we drop the term congestive and simply use the term heart failure. And that is mainly because many patients with heart failure do not manifest pulmonary or systemic congestion. So the terminology that is recommended by the panel to use now is simply heart failure. Now what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to talk about heart failure as a major public health problem. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute estimates that greater than 2 million Americans, which is 1 to 2 percent of the adult population, have heart failure. Also, approximately 400,000 new cases of heart failure are diagnosed annually. Now, although heart failure can occur at any age, the incidence of heart failure greatly increases after the age of 65. And what this means to us as healthcare providers is that as baby boomers age, we can expect that the prevalence of heart failure in the United States will greatly increase. Some other statistics for you in reference to age and the prevalence of heart failure include the fact that 1% of people greater than 50 years of age have heart failure, 5% of people greater than 75 years of age, and 10% of people greater than 80 years of age have heart failure. In reference to morbidity and mortality, approximately 1 million hospitalizations per year are as a result of heart failure. Mortality is high, with an average mortality at one year of 10%, and a five-year mortality in the range of 50%. 
probably what's even more important is that our patients with heart failures quality of life is significantly impacted mainly because of their symptomatology as well as their decreased functional capacity. Heart failure accounts for approximately 200,000 deaths in the United States annually. The hope is, however, that improved patient care can prevent many of these hospitalizations and can positively impact patient outcomes. Now, let's take a look at those hospitalizations and, in particular, the readmission rate for patients with heart failure. Heart failure is one of the most common causes for recurrent admissions to hospitals. And many studies have looked at why this occurs. In fact, one study estimated that approximately 57% of patients greater than 70 years of age were readmitted within 90 days after discharge from the hospital secondary to heart failure. Factors that have been identified in the study as preventative or preventable causes for these readmissions include failed social support, and that is the most common reason, and we need to keep that in mind, for these readmissions for patients with heart failure. And that is that there was lack of availability of family or caregiver support for these patients once they were discharged from the hospital. Inadequate follow-up has been another preventable factor identified in the readmission for these patients. Failure to seek prompt medical attention on the part of the patient when symptoms of their heart failure reoccurred, reoccurred or worsened. And I think we have to ask ourselves, um, were these patients adequately prepared prior to discharge? Did they know what symptoms to look for and how important it was to report these symptoms promptly to their health care practitioner? Other factors identified with this high readmission rate for patients with heart failure include noncompliance with diet, noncompliance with medication, and inadequate discharge planning. So what is the take-home message for us as health care providers? Proper discharge planning is absolutely essential for patients with heart failure to prevent unnecessary hospital readmissions. And in addition, we need to make sure that our patients have adequate education regarding their medications, regarding their dietary and physical activity restrictions or recommendations, exercise, a multitude of issues. We need to make sure that they understand these prior to discharge. The other important thing here is that patients need to be contacted and certainly ideally seen in the office within one week of discharge to make sure that they understand their discharge instructions and that they are complying with them. And certainly if there's any areas of non-compliance, we need to investigate why this is occurring and do something about it. For example, perhaps the patient is experiencing some side effects secondary to medication. We need to investigate that and do whatever we can to remove these obstacles to compliance. All right, now let's take a look at some of the major risk factors for the development of heart failure. The most common cause of heart failure is coronary artery disease. However, if your patient has a history of myocardial infarction, their risk for the development of heart failure increases four to six times. If your patient has a history of angina, diabetes, or uncontrolled hypertension, their risk for the development of heart failure is doubled. Ventricular dysrhythmias are common in patients with heart failure, and as a result, as many as 50% of all deaths from heart failure are sudden, and up to 25% of these deaths occur without any worsening of their symptoms of heart failure. It's also important to keep in mind that the majority of these deaths occur at home. So therefore, it's very important to discuss with our patient their desire for resuscitation. They need to be encouraged to complete 
an advanced directive so that their health care preferences are known to health care providers as well as to their family. Should our patients with heart failure desire resuscitation efforts, we should make sure that their family members or their primary caregivers know how to activate the emergency medical system. And in addition, family members should be recommended or at least advised to consider basic cardiac life support or CPR training. However, we also need to keep in mind that the patient's family members will most likely need a great deal of psychological support, especially if resuscitation efforts do not have a positive outcome. If your patient with heart failure does not, re does not desire resuscitation, it's important to provide the family members or the primary caregivers with a phone number that they can call, whether it's a nurse practitioner, um, a hospice worker, a physician, some number that they can access when the patient dies instead of activating the emergency medical system and starting up a chain of events which the patient most likely did not want to occur. During this presentation, the current Agency for Health Care Policy and Research recommendations for the care of patients with heart failure secondary to left ventricular systolic dysfunction have been reviewed. Emphasis was given to patient counseling and education, as well as to the initial pharmacological management of this most common type of heart failure. Thank you.